These are the notes for unit one, day eight, and they start on uh, page 21 of your packet. And um, today's focus is something called the intermediate value theorem. And we've got three really significant theorems um, that we're working in, on in calculus this year. Uh, this is one of the big three. So intermediate value theorem, if we, uh, if we kind of pick apart the name of this theorem, we see we have this phrase intermediate value. So intermediate kind of implies in between, you know, or in the middle, maybe not exactly in the middle, but in between two values. And so that's what this has to deal with. Um, so our essential question then today is what are the most important things to remember about the intermediate value theorem? Um, so here's your theorem uh, as it's stated in your textbook. And this verbiage up here is, is a little tricky to kind of navigate, but um, but we're going to pick it apart. So the intermediate value theorem for continuous functions. So that's really important. This is a theorem and it's a theorem only for functions that are continuous. If functions aren't continuous, then this theorem blows up, doesn't apply. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a second. Okay, so th this says basically a function y equals f of x, so that's the function, that is continuous on a closed interval from A to B. So those are the, this is the domain, right? From, from value A to value B. Takes on every value F of A between F of A and F of B. So if here is uh, X equals A and this is F of A, and here is X equals B and this is F of B, then, um, then we have this condition. And, and this is probably, the second sentence is probably make, May, is, is verbiage that uh, makes a little more sense. Um, if y sub zero is between f of a and f of b. So if y sub zero is between f of a and f of b. So basically this is saying, if I pick a value, a y value, between these two function values, right? So, you know, um, if, I, if I do something like here's y sub zero, I'm gonna let it fluctuate between f of a and f of b, and I'm gonna pick a random location. Okay, so if, if that is true, y sub zero is between f of a and f of b, then we have a y sub zero, which is, we were gonna call it f of c, um, for some location c in, a, in, in the domain a to b. So if we pick that, um, that random y sub zero, and this is between f of a and f of b, then its x value is in the domain. So it's kind of like if the y value is in the range, the x value is in the domain. That's kind of how it goes for continuous functions, right? Let's go back to the beginning. This is continuous. I don't have to lift my pencil. So um, let's take a look at this. This is an if then statement. We did these in, in geometry, right? So the antecedent, I'm writing it a little bit different than what they're saying up here, but it's the same thing, right? If f of a is the little guy, y sub zero, we're picking somewhere in between, and f of b is the big value. So if y sub zero is between f of a and f of b, then the consequent, then its x location is in the domain between a and b. So, um, so we pick this random y sub zero location, we go over to the function, and we are assured that we have at least one location and we're going to call that location C, okay, at least one location um, where we're going to be in the domain. So what, what does it mean by at least one? Well, what it means is I'm going to change this function a little bit down here. Let's say this function does this sort of thing. Okay, then I have several locations in the domain where I have this y value for this function. So it's going to be a, a guarantee of at least one value in the domain possibly more, okay? And again, the, the, the really big important thing is this is for continuous functions. If in this domain, we had like a jump or a hole or an asymptote, we couldn't use this, um, this value, intermediate value theorem over that domain. Um, let's look at a couple of multiple choice questions and kind of try to apply this. Um, these are these get kind of tricky when we're trying to apply a theorem here. Okay, so let's read let's read the uh, stem here. 
if function f let f let function f be a function that is continuous so we have this criteria so that's telling us yes we can use the intermediate value here we can apply it here it's continuous on the closed interval from two to four so again this is the domain um uh starting at x equals two ending at x equals four square brackets means it's closed interval it means we include the endpoints okay f of two is 10 and f of four is 20 which of the following is guaranteed by the intermediate value theorem so intermediate value theorem says if i have a value in the range then i have at least one value in the domain so i need to find a value in the range so um 13 is certainly in the range and um so option a is saying well if i pick a y value of 13 then that should correlate to at least one solution in the open interval from two to four. So this has the open interval instead of a closed interval. And so that's a, a more restrictive domain because it doesn't include the endpoints. That's okay. Um, and so this is actually the correct answer here. Um, and, and so it, it's not saying it's at any location, but it's saying I got to have at least one solution. And I could, I could have open interval, I could have closed interval, either one's applicable because an open interval is more restrictive than the closed interval. Um, let's take a look at why these other options are wrong. Okay, the second option here is saying f of 3 has to equal 15. So what, what they're kind of trying to get you to think here is, well, if f of 2 is 10, then f of 3 has to be 15, so that f of 4 can be 20. You know what I mean? They're, they're, they're trying to think they're trying to force you to think that it has to be linear and it doesn't so that's why that's wrong um let's look at this f attains a maximum on the open interval from two to four intermediate value theorem uh says nothing about a minimum or a maximum or any any of that type of verbiage so we can eliminate that just because it's using verbiage that that's not contained within within the value theorem intermediate value theorem so that's out now we're talking about this notation, and this is a little premature. This is called the derivative notation. Um, and so the reason why options D and E are even part of this question is because this question is used on the AP exam, and of course you've had all of the content by then. Um, so so these, these are a little bit premature for you to see at this point in time, but they would be certainly applicable for you to see um, by the end of first semester. Um, but Let's go back. Let's just go back to the intermediate value theorem, right? Intermediate value theorem says nothing about this notation, right? If we go, if we went back to the previous page, if you look up in your notes there at that definition of that theorem, you don't see this notation at all anywhere in the theorem. So we can rule that out immediately. Likewise for E, you don't see this notation in the theorem at all. You can rule that out immediately. So um, we're basically we're saying if my range is ten to twenty, and I pick thirteen, which is in the range then I have to have at least one solution in the domain. Uh, so that's why A is the right answer. Um, okay, let's take a look at this one. This one's a little trickier. Um, and it's a little trickier because it's asking us to find the statement that is not necessarily true. Okay, so let's talk about uh, what this uh, stem says here. Let G be a continuous function. So we have that continuous criteria again. So we know we can apply the intermediate value theorem if we have the correct description. So it's a continuous function on the closed interval from zero to one. So from X equals zero to X equals one. Now this is where it gets tricky because we, you see lots of zeros and ones here. So it's saying let G of zero equal one and let G of one equal zero. Which of the following is not necessarily true. In other words, which of the following is false? So the, the reason why this, may, I mean, there's lots of reasons why this is tricky. We're using repeated values for the range and domain, so we could get confused there. Not necessarily true means false. So in other words, if we can find at least one true case, then we can't pick that option. Okay, let's start looking at the options then. Option A says there exists a number H in the domain. So the H is an X value. There exists a number H in the domain from zero to one, such that, g of h is greater than or equal to g of x for all x in the domain from 0 to 1. So if I can find one instance where that's true, then I've got to rule out a. It might not be true all the time, but I just have to find one. So I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I'm going to, in order to address this, I'm going to paint this picture here. 
So G of zero is one, that's what they said. So I graphed that G of one is zero. So I graphed that. So I just said, well, let's just draw, let's just connect those points with a line. Okay, so there exists a number H in the domain such that G of H is greater than or equal to all, all G of X for all X. So yeah, that's right here. There exists a location H, in this case, H equals zero, where a, G of H, G of zero is one, and that number is bigger for all these other function values in the domain. So I found one instance where that's true. So since I found an instance, a case, so to speak, that where that's true, then I've got to rule out that as a, as a false answer, because it could possibly be true. That's what makes these, this wording that's not necessarily true really, really tricky. Okay, let's look at option B. For all A and B in the domain from zero to one, if A equals B, then G of A equals G of B. So what they're basically saying is A and B are the same number. So they're just, it really is just function notation. If I put A into the function and then I put B, which is the same value into the function, I should get the same function values. That's always true. So we can eliminate that. Let's look at option C. There exists a number in H in the domain, exists a number H in the domain from zero to one, such that G of H is equal to a half. Well, we have that instance right here. Um, there exists a number H at 0.5, where G of H is equal to a half. So that could possibly be true if we had the right function. In this case, we have the right function. So if it could possibly be true, then it's, then it's not false. Um, let's look at option D. There exists a number H in the domain from zero to one, such so that g of h is equal to three halves. So looking at that, three halves is up here, right? Three halves is one and a half. Well, my domain goes from one to zero. So in this situation, this is outside the range. So if it's outside the range, if you think back to the fact that, think back to the theorem and we, when we're using the antecedent and the consequence, right? Uh, the if-then statement, the antecedent, G of H is three halves. So the ante, this is making the antecedent false. And if the antecedent fall, is false, we can't prove anything about the consequent, if you remember that from geometry. If we start out with a false statement, we can't make a conclusion at all. So that's the one that's gotta be the acceptable answer because this is the one that's definitely false um, because it's outside that, it's outside the range. Um, and then taking a look at option E, just to kind of finish out the rationale here uh, for all H in the open interval. Um, so we're talking about the open interval, the domain from zero to one. Notice we're talking about, when, when we talk about the open interval, this almost looks like a ordered pair notation, right? X, Y coordinate, but it's not. It's a domain. It's just that the rounded brackets are the open interval that don't include the endpoints at the, that's that notation. And it says the limit as X approaches H of g of x is equal to g of h. That's just our, our definition of a limit. So um, that's got nothing to do with the intermediate value theorem. Again, we're seeing notation, right? Limit notation that was never part of the theorem. Just like in the previous multiple choice, we saw some derivative notation that wasn't part of the theorem at all. We just eliminate those right away when we start to see notation that's got nothing to do with the theorem. So that's obviously not, um, not a viable answer as well. Um, okay, so a bit trickier on that question, but um, uh, but I think you know we can navigate through that, and uh, and we'll have some questions like this as we go forward into um, our topic questions, and and we'll be able to navigate those as a class with our uh, pod mates and uh, with me if if needed as well.